on the October 2024 What's Neat. So on this What's Neat for October, it's gonna be nothing but layout construction. I'm continuing on the diorama over there, building it and figure out how to get that module, which was built permanently, cut away, cut out. The What's Neat Show is sponsored by Lombard Hobbies, your value hobby shop for over 40 years of modelers helping modelers. Big inventory, value pricing, fast shipping, and great service. And by Broadway Limited Imports, the cutting edge leader in model trains. Check out their website at broadway-limited.com. KR Models, we dare to build. Check out their website at krmodels.net. And by Bachman Trains. Now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at bachmantrains.com. And thank you for helping us support the best hobby in the world. This is What's Neat for October 2024. I'm your host, Ken Patterson, and this month, I'm doing actually right now, today, I wanna to talk about this, a photo shoot outside. And what I've got to share with you today on What's Neat is this new GP35 from Broadway Limited Imports that I'm photographing outside here today. This is an exquisite model in that, I mean, just look at the scale handrails, but all the detail on all of the GP35s from Broadway Limited are absolutely accurate to each road name and prototype. They're very, being very careful about how they're doing that. This model comes with the Paragon 4 sound which if you hadn't heard it yet, the diesel sound on this model is really dynamite. I've got a couple of tank cars behind it, the cryogenic tank cars from Broadway Limited as I'm doing this shoot. Check this model out at their website at broadwaylimitedimports.com. I think you'll be very pleased. I love the Southern Pacific and all the lighting effects that they put on that model. Also, I've got this uh, load here James Regeer actually printed this up and shared it on the podcast, so I'm doing a photo shoot of it outside. But he did an outstanding job. He said it took about a week to design it. 3D printing has come so far. I've also got in the background here some of the brand new What's Neat Box cars. We've got the two new ones. Uh, first one is the one with the arch on it here, which I think is really neat. It's that billboard type of a freight car. That would look really kind of cool weathered. Also, I've created a new box car, a brown box car that's more prototypically accurate in my opinion. Something that maybe some of the gentlemen out there that like to weather these models might tackle and do just that to it. So it's kind of neat. I'm really excited in that the What's Neat This Week show, be sure to check it out. We shoot it every Saturday night down here, uh, keeping you updated on what's new in the hobby on a weekly basis. Uh, just some exciting shows in the past. The Big Boy Show is one that I remember in my mind. Just absolutely amazing images that we got from Scout Scott Nowert on that show. But so on this What's Neat for October, it's gonna be nothing but layout construction. I'm continuing on the diorama over there, building it. I wanna light it up. And this segment of the show, you're gonna see me patch some more of the cement work and figure out how to get that module, which was built permanently, cut away, cut out, moved, so we can flip it up and actually work on the lighting underneath. It's gonna be a great segment. I think I'm gonna break it up into two parts because it's a lot of material to just simply digest in one month. But that's the lineup. Also, we've got Bachman Industries announcing the fall lineup of a lot of the new products that are coming out. I was so excited last month to hear about that auto rack, that scale, that four car auto rack that they had introduced. I thought it was absolutely amazing and it's prototypically accurate to a Frisco prototype that they had built even down to the car numbers. So good job, hats off to Bachman for that. This Broadway limited stuff that I've been sharing with you on the show, you can check it out. They sell that. When I was at Lombard Hobbies, we saw a lot of beautiful Broadway limited steam locomotives in the cases. So check them out. They are your to-go source for the viewers of the What's Neat show. We really appreciate all of the folks that help us produce this show. And so with that, 
let's continue on with the rest of this October 2024 What's Neat. For this segment of What's Neat, I've been working with lift-out sections across this doorway now for going on better than 30 years. And I've had a lot of great designs. I've had one that was on hinges. I've got another one here that was rather permanent and large. And it worked really well. And I've got this smaller one here that hasn't warped yet over the years. This locomotive pulling a string of what's neat this week cars is one of the most unusual models that I have ever had the privilege to photograph and work with. This is a locomotive that was designed in the UK from 1945 and this one unit was tested extensively from 1949 through 1950. And what this is, is the leader class locomotive. A man by the name of Oliver Bullied was set on showing that steam still had its benefits and could be redesigned to the point of creating a locomotive that couldn't be made obsolete by a diesel because it would have mechanical and brand new technology built into it of everything that they've learned during the war years. This locomotive had a cab on both ends. The firemen filled the coal into the locomotive from the middle here, which was a very hot environment to work in. This locomotive was articulated and it's a chain drive. So it's considered an 060060. And yes, the little bumpers on the front, everything operates. Very beautifully finished model from KR Models. Now, if this did in fact continue and they were building five of them, if this turned out to be a success, the railroads had plans to be painting it in the paint schemes of the railroad at the time, which was gonna be black. Uh, this one was originally painted black, but then they painted it silver because they wanted, didn't want to let the cat out of the bag that there was a new paint scheme coming and this machine was ready before the rest of the machines on the railroad at the time were ready to show off the new paint scheme. So they made this one silver as not to give up the secret. But this model's got low sound sound in it, absolutely fantastic sound. When it runs, the locomotive's uh, sink, the chuff sinks from both sets of drivers in and out of sync, which really sounds fantastic. So check this model out. It's available in multiple paint schemes at KR Models. You will be absolutely impressed with what it is that you see. The thing is designed well. It runs fantastic. HO scale, a one-of-a-kind piece for the UK market. Just an absolutely beautiful collector's locomotive. And so I had to share it with you, the viewers here, on What's Neat. this segment of what's neat I really want to light this diorama that you've seen me working on 
through three or four different part series on building the foam diorama, laying the track, building all of the parking spaces, the cement, the roads, the building. So many steps so far to go through the process on this simple, what's relatively a flat diorama. All right, so I've built my layout so that all of my foam modules that are built on top of tabletops can be taken outside to shoot videography, run-bys of trains, and or still photography. I've been doing that for years since I've been doing ads in the model press and different articles over time before I started doing all of these videos. So it was mandatory in my mind that I build every scene so that it would be removable. And when I started building this scene, four inch thick foam, not very deep, easy to reach, and about 51 inches off, at level of track height, easy to see when you're standing here for a person my height of 5'9". But what I want to do, I believe, is make this segment that I started to build as more or less a permanent section. I'm not gonna take it out. I was gonna build all the scenery with it against this wall, as you've seen me do for most of it. Now that it's coming time to light it, in order for it to be a permanent layout, of course, I've gotta be able to get underneath it. I've decided to use some really great lights I've discovered from Atlas. Uh, they come in 30 foot tall lamps. They are LEDs. I've got the warm light that comes off the LEDs. They also offer these in cool white. They offer them in black and bronze. These are in fact the black ones that are 30 foot tall. They also make them 15 foot tall. So various types of lights for shopping centers, gas stations, and otherwise industrial type buildings. So I thought I would light the scene with this. And these don't have all that much wire. When I unravel the wire, it's about, about seven or six inches long, okay? Which will just get me through the foam and I need more than that. I've got one of these lights connected to batteries. They've been running all night. These are the warm lights, just so I could understand the layout and how the cast light would look. And so far, this is very good. I figured out placement of where I'm gonna put these lights. But again, there's not that much wire. As you can see, I've got some batteries connected to the wire here. So there actually looks like five inches of wire, let's just say. That's just enough to get through the foam and leave about an inch coming out the bottom. If this was a permanent layout, I would have built it probably with plywood so that it would be thin, and easy to drill through, easy to wire underneath like I've done on all of my past permanent layouts over the years. With the advent of foam, four inches thick to go through, I'm on top of metal studs, plus I've got a lot of shelving down here that I keep my scenery supplies on and such, which is great on the bottom of the diorama, I don't really need to gain access to anything if this module is removable. So that's what I want to do because there's no space to work underneath here. It's four inches thick. I don't want wires hanging down here. And I want to not also have to move these shelves every time I would have to maintain something or work on something. So I need to cut this module out. Now, the module itself was designed on the end here to match up with the switch yard. And so what do I mean by that? It's cut to shape of the switch yard. Okay, I added a little piece of wood here for my transitional curve out of the switch yard onto the scene. But otherwise, it's kind of a jagged edge cut. It's not even. My thought would be to cut out the track, six inch pieces of track, remove the ties and the track and everything and have it simply come back into place and rail joiner slide onto it every time I remove and put the module back. I don't think I'm gonna do that. I want three inch pieces of rail because it's more discreet. Removable three inch pieces of rail with N scale Atlas rail joiners works perfect. It doesn't come loose. The trains run through it. But the problem is this jagged edge. I mean, for example, look at how the track right here, it's not even straight across. It's up the middle of the track is where the divide is. So it would be impossible to cut this module and actually have it look uh, decent when it's put back together. It would look just kind of bad. So what I'm going to do, I believe, is square up this module. It's over 12 feet long based on the ceiling tile count. So I'm going to take, I've got six inches here from the edge of the foam module to the turnout. I'm going to cut out three inch pieces of rail somewhere in here. I'm going to take a saw. 
I'm gonna cut the foam all the way across square. I'm gonna use another type of saw and I'm gonna cut the plywood right here so it's square and just have a simple straight line of where the diorama's cut and where I can put the three inch rail sections back in. Once this diorama is removable, then I can really have fun with it in that I can start installing lights and do a lot of other things to it, whereas I can get the module out, bring it into the shop, get to it from all four sides and work on it and not have to worry about getting any paint or any goo or plaster or cement or anything like that on the wall. So at this point, I need to cut this apart. I can't wait to see how that turns out. It should be perfect. I will work on it, tweak it, shim it, make sure that it is. Cut the other side at the far end. I have three tracks down there that need to be cut. Same way, three inch pieces of rail. And then at that point, we're gonna pull this module out and put these lights on it and just see if we can't bring this thing to life when the lights are turned down low. And so now let's continue on with this segment of what's neat. Uh, as usual, I can't wait to see how it comes out, but based on past stuff, it's going to look dynamite. All right, I've got a Dremel. I'm going to cut these rails, and I'm going to try something on this end. I think on this end, I'm just going to cut the rails in one spot. And I've had good luck with this on a lift out section where I can just put rail joiners on this and not have a three inch section of rail to pull out. So I wanna see how that works. It may or may not work. If it doesn't, I'll cut out the three inch pieces of rail, but we need to get this module cut apart. So we're gonna cut the rails first, then I'll cut the plywood on the front, then I'll take a saw and cut the foam, and then it'll be difficult to figure out how to cut the plywood on the back because this diorama is completely wrapped in wood. And just like that, I've cut up some perfectly good track. So let's, uh, let's continue on with this and see how this works out. Can't wait. This is the best tool I've found for cutting fascia on existing dioramas. It doesn't really involve any great shaking or destruction to the module. And I need to do this right now. I've drawn a straight line here where the cut's going to be. Okay, so when I'm cutting through, I've got blocks of wood in there running parallel that this is attached to, and that's what I was cutting through. Okay, I've come to the conclusion here that I'm going to not be able to just cut the rails and have the tracks match up because I have no way to get a saw into here and really underneath all of the track. Plus, I've still got to cut the plywood back there, and the only way to get to that is to come straight up and down in the crack with a saw vertically, like this, to cut the module out. So what I'll end up doing is trying to put the shortest rail sections in that I can. I can maybe go with one inch or one and a half inch, which will require uh, four rail joiners for each piece of track all the way across, including the Code 55 rail. I'm not going to cut that one. I really don't. I just, I think this one will be just fine. I can get a saw in here and do the rest. So I'm just going to rip out this rail right where we cut it and get a saw in here and cut this foam. This kills me to cut perfectly good track. It 
It's progress, right? Let's see. So I've cut through the foam, and now it's just coming down to the plywood. And as you can see, I'm just gonna draw this up and down until I get through that quarter inch plywood. Okay, I'm cut all the way across. I ended up using this fine saw that I actually cut the ends off of, so I've got teeth all the way to the edge of the blade. And then I run it up and down just like this, and I cut right through the plywood. So this section, as you can now see, moves, which is good or bad. Now I've got a cut on the other end down here, and pull the section out and just see if it works out more square than what this camera angle just was. So after having the diorama pulled out, I'm looking over the whole thing and I'm figuring out the placement of the various two types of 30 foot Atlas lights that I've got. Also upon looking at the diorama, since I've never actually seen it now from the backside with the scenery in place, I'm not really happy with a couple of things. There's an edge right here, right here, and it runs all the way throughout. And I think what I want to do here is take some cement and the uh, a small putty knife, painter's knife, and just go along this with some more cement because I want the cement all the way against the wall or the asphalt pavement against the wall. So I'm going to do that. That's going to take. 24 hours to dry and in reality a couple of the lights like one in particular here near the building will be in this area So I need that cement to set up before I can actually set in that light So but I also cleaned up the back side of this as it did have some dirt and Scenery ooze as it oozed between the wall, but everything else is good as you can see the wall is clean so, you know, doing scenery on a permanent layout with a backdrop that's permanent in place, I'd rather be able to get all the way around. So one good reason for being able to take the modules out is to be able to get all the way around them and service them in the event. Also, you want to change out the scene, you can certainly do that uh, very quickly designing it this way. If I were to build this as a permanent layout, I think I would just simply go with open grid because then the wiring underneath, I don't want to go through so much material. I've got room to put in switch machine motors. I got room to put in crossing gate things. Everything else on this diorama, and in fact, when we do put in crossing gates, will have to be encased into the foam, or the foam underneath will have to be cut out to such a degree that you can have room for the electronics and the servos. So kind of modeling with foam like this has got its learning curves. So I've decided to go ahead and uh, work on this uh, pavement right here on the edge. I put up a straight edge. I've got it clamped in position. The exact same smooth height. So the building's foundation, everything will match. So this will make the scene look just that much better.
So I've got the module standing on its end on this cart. And what I've done and what I'm presently doing is I'm marking with a Sharpie underneath the diorama where all the metal studs and the bench work over there are. So I'll know what, what areas I'll have complete access to when the diorama is in place. So that'll give me an idea of where to put the light hubs so I'll be able to get underneath with a screwdriver and switch the potentiometer to um, low or bright lighting depending upon what it is that I might want. So at this point, I'm going to let the cement on the other side, the patchwork that you saw me doing, that's setting up right now. It's set up, it's cured enough where I can tip it on its side. I'll sand that out in the morning, make sure that all looks decent and start uh, drilling holes and putting the lights in place and carving out underneath the foam where I'll run channels for the wiring, for all the lighting and the light hub. And eventually at some point, I'm gonna have to put blocks in for the trackage. Now that it's been cut, it's not gonna receive its power from either end of the diorama. So it's gonna need its own power feed wires and then block switches on the uh, flat uh, fascia so that at some point we could actually take this outside and run it outside with uh, DCC, sound, the whole nine yards to get some great long run buys. Okay, continuing to work, I've got all of the placements of the lights plotted now on top with a Sharpie. I just put some marks on the diorama. So I've got one here and here. I've got two at the loading platform on this side here. Now to light the building, I'm gonna just simply drill a hole through the foundation of, I've marked a, a circle right here. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna run the wires, just the power feed wires to the building through the foam and put a small connector right there so that I can actually unplug it, lift the building up and unplug it. So all the lights themselves will be contained and daisy chained together in the building or run parallel somewhere in the walls of the building down to the hole in the foundation. Now I've got an idea on the lighting. I wanna talk about this. Well, I've got the placement of all the tall poles in the parking lot figured out. I took one of these Atlas lights. This is a single lamp light. And I pulled the end off of it right here. I'm holding it in my hand. So that's the lamp shade. There's the small LED right here. Okay. So I'm gonna mount this to the building, drill holes in the building and run these LEDs, the wires, and use these as lights mounted to the side of the building. So if I put two on each end and three in the middle, plus the interior lighting on the structure itself, um, that'll be a really well lit structure and then it'll all of a sudden become obvious that it doesn't have interior in it. And that'll be a whole nother video. So just one step at a time, kind of methodically working my way through this. Uh, I'm going to pull out the Woodland Scenics uh, just plug system and hook up one of these lights to it, make sure everything jives, and probably use their linker plugs and some of the wiring that comes with that Woodland Scenic system to be able to uh, adapt it to this project. And so let's see what happens next. So I'm putting holes in the uh, bottom of the foam here where the lights position are going to be on top. And it's really great to be able to put this diorama on its side like this. This is not how I planned on doing this. I thought I'd take the hot foam cutter out, but I've got this hole saw that I've never really used before and I've probably had it for 20 years and I'm cutting out the foam, the bottom layer, that's as far as the saw will go, 
and then pulling out the pieces. And it works. like that. So that's less space that I've got to fish the wires through. And so what I'll do is I'll tie all these cavities together to run the wires. And for that I'll probably use the uh, hot foam cutter. So I've got to get 14 holes drilled, uh, the hole for the building. I've also figured out underneath here where I should put the light hubs. So this will be the area that I'm going to install the light hubs. And the reason I chose that is because I've got the metal studs running right through here. And this will put me closer to the end of the diorama where I know there's an outlet. And then I'm taking this blue Sharpie and I'm drawing channels to connect all of these lights together in a manner that we'll be able to group them into groups and then plug them into the light hub with the appropriate uh, amount of current being drawn for each port. Also, the building itself will be self-contained with many lights and simply plug in. And this is the cavity for the building right here. So everything's going to be relatively perfectly laid out as I now pull out the hot foam cutter and start cutting out uh, the cavities that we'll lay all the wires into and then wire everything up and make it work. And just like that, no hot foam cutter here, just a mess. But now we've got our channels. So after patching a lot of the cracks, and as described, I filled in that cement all the way along the edge here. I've made a discovery that I did not know about this cement now that I've been using in What's Neat videos for so long. You can wet sand this. I've got some, uh, a piece of old scrap, garnet, almost black, sandpaper, very coarse. And I've got a spray bottle, and all I had was some additional cracks in the pavement. And so I used the putty knife and obviously put it all down, as you saw me do. Well, now I've wet it, and I'm sanding out all of the, like, just like drywall work. I didn't know you could do that with this cement medium. But it is latex based and this is working beautifully. Just elbow grease and plenty of water and it seems like all of the, the sand and all of the latex material just comes out beautifully and then a paper towel to sop it up. You could almost vacuum it up. It would be better if you had a wet vac. But see, in areas where there was a simple crack, I don't need all that additional. So yeah, check it out, it works. So with all the channels cut underneath the foam to run our wires and space to get your hands up underneath there, no circular holes to pull the wires for the lights through. The plan is to take a 3 32nd inch drill bit. That's what seems to fit the base of these lights. I tested it in a piece of wood with multiple holes and the lights fit perfect. Then I'm going to take this uh, tube, this brass tube, that's the same size as the drill bit. And I'm going to force this brass tube into the hole that we drill all the way through the foam. And then I'll pull the wires through the brass tube which will allow the wire to go through the foam without getting hung up, and then we'll pull this out the bottom. And I've got to do that for the first six lights that are going to be the double light masts. I've got six of those, and then we'll start doing the single lights and just see how many of them that I can get drilled into this in a matter of time 
and then we're going to start working on the building. The building itself will have 14 lights in it, exterior lights, interior lights, and it's going to look dynamite. Okay, so these Atlas lights, these are double arm square lights, black, 30 foot tall with warm LEDs. Okay, it's a three pack. And as you open up the package on these, you will see, actually I didn't see this to begin with, I learned this on the podcast when Steve Mantia po uh, pointed it out to me. There are instructions right here that talk about the lights and it talks about how to solder on the resistors, okay? And I'm gonna solder them on in the black wire just like it shows here. And it also tells us what size to drill to use to drill the holes. I found 3 32nd worked just fine. They say a number 47 drill bit. Well, I don't have any number drill bits here. And it also discusses the uh, resistors, the values and what have you. So it was good to find this in the packaging. There are three lights here and the resistors are right here in the bottom. You don't want to lose the resistors and it appears that you don't want to mix up the resistors of the double headlights to the ones of the single headlights because they have different values. So just a little tip as now I'm going to, I've drilled all the holes, I'm going to insert all of these into the holes and pull the wires through the brass tube until I have them all done, then we'll flip the diorama up and solder the resistors onto each set of lights. Okay, right before installing the lights, uh, I decided it would be better to take uh, the just plug lighting system. As I did on the wharf scene, I've mounted two of the uh, light hubs onto a piece of wood, and I've also put the expansion hub that I think I'm gonna use right here. So I'm gonna power, is gonna go straight into this, off of the uh, wall transformer. Then two wires, one each, will go to each one of these light hubs. And I'm gonna run a third one to a light hub that's gonna go either underneath or inside of the building because that's gonna have 14 lights on it. So what I'm simply gonna do is take, uh, I usually use Gorilla Glue for this and water. I've made a spot where I'm gonna put it right here in the diorama. And so that when the module is set in its spot, I can get underneath it with a screwdriver and adjust the potentiometers to adjust the uh, light values of each set of lights, which is a very uh, convenient thing, especially for the bright interior lights. So I'm just gonna take, without making a mess, a little bit of this uh, great stuff adhesive and make me a spot. be a wonderful mess. And just lay this right in here. Sure is a lot easier to be able to do this with a module on a table like it is. I'm going to stick a screwdriver in here to prevent it from moving outward if, and if, if the uh, foam expands which this foam does not expand very much. This will hold everything in place until it sets up. And that should hold it. And it's flush, so it's not going to be affected. Okay, I'm making progress here. And here's the process of installing these lights. I've got some of these double pole lights I've put up. They're very easy to maneuver and straighten. Here's a single lamp. I've got it marked here where it went. I'm using the 3 32nd inch drill bit. Super easy drilling into the cement and the foam. Now there's no way I could get a wire to go through this, right? The trick is a piece of tubing. This is smaller than 3 30 seconds. Put it 
right in the hole. And I've got the diorama now sitting up atop of uh, about four two by sixes on each side. So that gives me all of seven inches or so, eight inches of clearance. So the tube is in here. And what I want to do is I want to stick the wires, which I've got them tight. And I can barely see this. And I want to put them into the tube which gives a nice clear conduit channel to get the little small fine wires into our diorama which would never pass through the foam by themselves. I've got the wires all the way down here. Now I'm going to pull the tube through the diorama and the wires pull right out the bottom and we have access to the wires underneath. That's the process. And I'm going to continue doing this with these single lamps. Uh, I've got five of the double lamps. So I'm going to put one more of those and then I'm out of those until I order more to finish this pro side of the project. So single lamps, I think I have three or four more to put in. And then we'll get underneath and start wiring up the resistors. So before ending last night or yesterday's work, I did drill all the holes and the brass tubing and the wiring and installed all of the various uh, light heads, as you can see here. And I've got the layout on its end, a couple bar clamps holding it in place so it will not move. The light hubs are all glued in place now, as I showed. And I went ahead and powered up this expansion hub. I've got the power supply right here. And I got the two light hubs. I connected the power leads from the expansion hub to the power in on each light hub. So each one of these have got power. And I ran one of the linker plug lines to one of the lights. And what I've been doing uh, today is I've been soldering on these resistors onto the black wire leads on all of the double lamps. I've got resistors in my hand here. These are the ones for the single lamps, which I've got five more of those to wire up. But just wanting to know that everything was going to work, I went ahead and hooked up one of the Atlas double light poles to the linker plug. So it's connected, it was powered, and I delightfully walked over to the other side of the module to find that the light is in fact lit. Okay, so yeah, that light right there is lit. And it looks good. It casts a nice amount of light and a nice yellowish hue. So what I'm gonna do is solder the breast of the resistors to the single lamp post. Like I said, there's five. I'm simply doing that. I'm using uh, resin to clean the wires, rosin solder as well, and this nice little Milwaukee uh, soldering rig with no wires attached, which is very convenient. So let me continue on with these five, and then what I'm gonna do is figure out how I'm gonna link everything together, run the wires, probably run a lot of black uh, small gauge wire to line up everything, to wire up everything. Still continuing to wire the lights underneath our foam. I've been, so far I've got this area here. Let me show you this. And I've run the wires from the lights and all of our um, resistors are in line on the black sides. And I've run two different colored wires, black and orange, so I can differentiate uh, positive and negative. And then I've got the linker plug here so that I'm going to connect these two black wires to the linker plug and that'll take care of the six lights right here on one of the light hub circuits. And something else I wanna show you, I like to take these staples, one inch staples, and I like to um, push those into the foam to hold the wire in place while I'm wiring things. And then I'll take some of the foam pro, the orange foam and put 
fill this crack with it, burying the wires into the foam permanently. I've also taken apart a Woodland Scenics uh, just plug switch. Let me grab that. And I've taken it out of its uh, case that it comes in. So I just, and it's the same type of rocker switches that I like to use for my blocks if you've watched any of my previous uh, What's Neat videos that I've produced. Uh, and this switch will simply plug into the extension hub, expansion hub right here. And then I'll run the wire through the foam here and I'm going to drill a hole into the foam, into the uh, outside quarter inch plywood and mount the switch into the fascia. So I'll have an on and off switch to power on and off all of the lights. So now I'm going to continue on here as I've got probably another eight or nine lights to wire up. And I've also run a power wire from the light hub straight through right here, which is going to run up and come out where the building is going to go. I think I'm going to put a light hub inside the building. The building is going to have 14 lights in it, and that'll ensure even distribution of the power to all those LED lights inside the building. So as I continue on, I'm going to wire the rest of this up now and get this diorama laid flat and see what's the next step in this process. I figured it would take only about five hours to solder all of this and complete this job. But in between life's uh, interruptions, it's taken longer than that. One thing I do want to say, and the reason I wanted to record this quick segment is what a blessing it is to be able to work on this standing straight up on a table instead of on a permanent layout, I'd be underneath the layout, working, looking up. It just, it would be, it would be so much more difficult to complete the processes needed as opposed to just doing this right here like this. So there's definitely something to be said for having a modular layout that comes apart. So I'm installing the rocker switch. You just saw me drill out the hole in the fascia. And I'm gonna use a piece of brass tubing here and put it in the hole I drilled. And I've shoved it through the foam initially to make sure I had good clearance. I'm gonna stuff this wire into the small brass tube. And as you can see, it's gonna come out here Right, where we want it, and I can pull the tube out, and there's our wire. I'll remove this daisy chain plug on the expansion hub and plug the light switch into the expansion hub so we'll have on and off control of the lights from the outside of the diorama. Just like that. And I've got everything powered up here, meaning I've plugged in the Woodland Scenics transformer and all of the wiring has now been stuffed into place as far as I can go because I don't have all of the lights. I still am missing three or four more lights that are, as of the making of this, presently on order. So we'll lay this down. all the lights, believe it or not, they are lit. They're not extremely bright because I've got so many halogens on it. And I'm going to push in the rocker switch. And down is off and up is on. I'm going to push that rocker switch in right here. This should fit perfect. If not, I do know one side where there's a little bit of carving that needs to be done because the switch has got something on it to keep it from rotating. And my hole is exactly the diameter of the plastic switch. So I will have to do that before I can shove it in, but no, look at this, it's going just perfectly into the plywood. And that's all I want. That's not gonna go anywhere, and it doesn't need to be glued into place, and I can flip the switch off and flip the switch back on. 
and our lights are at the moment lit. Um, I just need to square up all of the poles and I still need to put all of the lighting into the building. Nothing's glued in place yet. I'm probably gonna glue the poles in with something that's easy to get out so I can replace them. So either some Woodland Scenics sticky tack or maybe simply some white glue. So I've got all the wiring now in place for all of the lights that I have presently. I still have more lights that are going to arrive before I can finish the top side of the light part of this project. So what I want to do now, and I've got this connected still to a transformer, so I'm going to want to unplug this, but I want to lay it flat and put it in a position, and see how the lights look. Okay, with the module back in place, and I've got the lights down here turned down, this is what we have so far. About 12 lights are in position. I like the lighting that they cast. I have a few more lights on order to fill the area. I believe I'm gonna add another six lights to the foreground part of the scene. And I still gotta put 14 lights in the building, which is gonna be its own projects unto itself. But rock and roll. I like the way this is turning out so far. Um, the lampposts themselves are black. I might do something with regards to changing the color tone on them because black really doesn't exist in the world. I think more of a weatheredish, grayish tone would look great on that. So I also want to put block wires in this so that when I put the module back in the place, there'll be no reason to take it out except for to shoot it for video or take pictures with it. So at this point, let's uh, continue on as we add block wiring. And I also need to add utility poles and electrical wiring to the top side. And I'm not sure about crossing gates yet for this video, but so far this is what I've got. It looks decent. Next month, we will continue on with the project of the lights. I will tell you that during readers' comments, I noted that some people said that we really enjoy spending the time with you and watching you think through the process and then watch you build things. And that's kind of how I've been editing this last piece that you've just seen. Now I will tell you I'm filming the good with the bad in that you saw me putting all of the resistors onto the Atlas lights and on the next segment you're going to watch me take them off because I failed to recall and I made the video on the just plug lighting system that in fact the linker plugs have already got resistors built into them. And so by removing the resistors in the next segment, as I will do, the lights will become about 25% brighter than they were because essentially by putting on the Atlas resistors in with the linker plug resistors, I was having double resistance. Now, during the filming of this project, another company has come to my attention. This is called a Dioramo Scale modeling and what I'm holding in my hand they call it the lighting system hub and this has got five jacks on each side of it making for a total of 10 jacks so when you plug in the 12 volt power supply into this you've got 12 jacks plus the ability of expansion through this and I will tell you I've got another system here same thing, except for this has got a dimmer switch built into it, and I do in fact have this one plugged in 12 volts. So I should be able to take a light, plug it right into this, and just like that, it does work. With the ability to dim it, 
which is neat. They have an array of lighting on their website, different size LEDs. Um, one of the LEDs that I saw was like a trash can fire, which I thought was kind of a good idea. This is a diorama blinker flip-flop flasher, which also looks like one of the hubs. So if I plug this device into the expansion on this dimmer unit, the expansion is not dimmable. So that means that this blinker flip-flop flasher is now active. And I've got a small miniature LED onto this. And by adjusting this, I can change the flash rate. In fact, there's another light over here. You can see this is flashing very, very slowly. And as I increase it, obviously it can flash faster. But the point of this, I guess, would be something maybe antenna lighting on a radio antenna or any other type of lighting where you'd want uh, flashing. Also, there are three ports or four ports on one side and four ports on the other side. And I can tell you that they flash opposite of each other on the ports. So now I've got these two lights. And as you can see, they're flashing opposite of each other. So another interesting thing, I believe this company has a lot to do with dollhouse lighting too, but they've made their products uh, aware to me and I'm going to experiment with them further and probably light an entire scene using this system because I think it'll be kind of fun and exciting to try something different. They've got an array of products on their website. Like I said, they also sent me some wire and I love this wire. It's super fine and very rubber, almost flexible. So that's a tip. And so with that now, we are going to continue on with the rest of this What's Neat show. I believe we've got the Bachman interview with the fall lineup coming next. And so that ends this segment of What's Neat until next month when we continue on finishing up this uh, lighting project. For this segment of October's What's Neat, I've got Larry Harrington, all the way from beautiful Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, to give us a review of all the fall products coming up. Larry, how are you? Doing well, Ken. I, I don't have all the fall products with me today, but I have a few that were we just got samples in for and a couple that just came in stock as well. So I uh, figured I'd give you a talk about that. It's been a couple months since I've talked to you last. How you been? I'm fantastic, and you still look good. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, there's been a lot going on here. We've had the big boy locomotive come through this. Uh, oh, my God. That was so amazing. Um, the RPM meet was amazing. Matt Stern was awesome. I'm getting nothing but positive feedback from everybody that I talk to about Matt Stern. He's just people love him. He's, he's a great guy. We've we've got we've made some really good uh, um, hires in the last couple of years. Tyler Haney as well. Um, Matt. Um, we have uh, a new uh, graphic artist, Helen Ashbrook. She's really doing really well too. Um, so overall, we've you know we're making some good uh, employee um, additions here at Bachman. So we're real happy with that. No, so. you guys are top notch. Your graphics department has been making us those ads for Model Railroader Magazine, which is something that I didn't know really how to create based on the deadline that I had to get this stuff done. Right. And you right. guys graciously took the project, and the work is amazing. Well, thanks. I'll, I'll pass that along to the guys uh, <laughs> and ladies. So um, anyway, uh, yeah, so it's it's been, uh, we just, you know, a couple months ago, we had the NMRA show out in California. We did that, had a very uh, good um, response to all the stuff we were announcing out there. Um, we just, a couple days ago, we just got in our first decorated sample of our, our new HO Dreyfus Hudson and I'll tell you, this thing is absolutely gorgeous. Um, I got it here in front of me. If I can hold it up, it's this thing. The engine weighs about a pound and a half, oh, just wow. the engine itself. It's all die cast boiler and chassis, and it's just just gorgeous paint scheme details. 
came out really, really nice. Yes. Uh, we put it on our Facebook account, and it, it, it just blew up with comments, most, you know, positive. We had a couple of uh, things pointed out that we're going to need to fix, but that's fine. We're, that's what's good for. And we'll have um, – this will be out. I don't know the exact date yet, but we're working on it to get it out as soon as possible. And we'll have uh, passenger cars to match the, the consist. So oh, we wow. have a, a baggage car, um, and then we have uh, three Pullman cars. And I don't have the observation here with me, but we also have the observation car that goes with this set as well. Um, it's going to be a really sharp-looking set. So I, I've, I've never been a super fan of uh, the streamlined locomotives, but this is, this is a sharp-looking locomotive. Wow, congratulations yeah, on that. Everything yeah. coming from you guys has been just top notch. So we're, we're excited about this. This will come with um, the same sound system as their conventional Hudson came. will be the, the full wow sound from C TCS. Okay. Which is, sounds incredible. Um, they got a, uh, an authentic sounding uh, whistle and it's just, uh, <laughs> it's really good. With their, they have that chuffinity where it kind of varies the chuff, um, you know, sounds as it, as it labors and goes down and drifts and all that. It's really, really cool system that they've developed. Um, so that's uh, that's what we have in, in HO that we just got a sample for. Um, this one has been, we've been awaiting this for a while. This is our um, oh, phase nice. three um, train sim world uh, ACS 64. It's, it was been in our production pipeline for way too long, but we've, we've got it in stock now. It's shipping, and it's, it's, you know, this was uh, based on the, you know, they did a wrap on um, Locomotive 662. They kept it on there much longer. It was so popular that normally they don't stay on that long, but they kept the wrap on as long as they could until, it's, until it started to deteriorate. And uh, so uh, maybe there's hope one day they'll do a heritage paint scheme per permanently in the ACS 64s, and we'll, we'll see if that comes out in the future. And then we can have another number to do. So uh, that's a great running model too. I yeah, it's a great. And this again has TCS Wow Sound. This was our very first project with TCS, um, and they they knocked it out of the park. We got we had cooperation with um, Amtrak for recording sessions, and we also later on uh, fine tuned it a little bit with um, a little closer to home. SEPTA has the ACS 64 as well, and we we got a few more um, you know more. Uh, intricate sounds on the on the um, locomotive that we didn't get the first time around. So um, that's uh, the two two items I have to show for HO. Um, now we just another painted sample we just got in was oh, our sweet. Via Charger and N scale. Um, this will be out sometime next year, but we're working on that and we're also working on the matching cars to go with them. Um, but this turned out really nice. Again, another uh, Wow Sound project. This was it's basically the same as the Charger HO decoder, only sh um, shrunken down a little bit. Right. So it fit, fit inside the. Uh, there we go. You got one there. You got the, the big HO one. scale one, and it's so beautiful with the cars. Big brother, yeah. Right. We're waiting. The tail end car will be coming, I guess, in 25. Yeah, we we had some challenges with uh, some things, but we got it straightened out finally, and it'll be going in, into production soon. Well, 25 is going to be here in just a couple more months. I yeah, mean, it's, yeah. It's, it's it already Christmas. Right around the corner, it's, we're talking Christmas. I know. <laughs> I know. I know. I know. Well, speaking of Christmas, How do we slow that down? Yeah, you know, Christmas, the, the um, large-scale uh, elf speeder. So, Sweet. Um, yeah, this, this, for all, this is the only thing I have to show in large-scale today, but this... Um, it's very, very uh, festive uh, Christmas item. It's the Elf Express, um, numbered one half for the road number. It's got a blinking uh, beacon on top, two Elf figures inside, and then paint it in your traditional green and um, red and white Christmas colors with the candy cane uh, safety stripes on the front there. So uh, it's a lot of fun. It's a uh, that's, you know, you got to have some fun in, in the serious world of model hardware. <laughs> so, um, and uh, finally, I got, um, we, we just got these in as, in production. Um, it's, they just came into the warehouse. So these are our N-scale SD40s with sound. Nice. And these have the um, the uh, soundtracks decoder in them, Economy. Um, so they, they are in stock now. We have four, four road names. Um, and these are two of them, Union Pacific, Northern, Norfolk Southern, 
CSX, and I think the fourth one is Santa Fe. I, I, I failed to write that down before I came into the to the to the live stream here, but I believe that's correct. Very nice. Um, but you can find out any more details for any of our products. So um, just go to BachmanTrains.com, and it'll take you right to our main page there. And you can you know search with the search bar for the either description or um, or the item number, and you can also click on like the we have a a new um, products arrival section. You can click on that and see what just came in um, that you've been waiting for, and uh, got more stuff coming in every day. Um, so it's it should be an exciting uh, holiday season for everybody. Yeah, here we go. And that website that you've just described is amazing. It is just top notch with regards to presentation. It looks good. Thank you. We worked we worked over a year on that and took. Uh, a little bit longer than we anticipated, but we have a lot of um, features as far as um, the, the product description is more robust than it was before. It points out all the good uh, good points of the model, all the information you would need. Um, and then it also has, uh, we try to put documentation with the model. So if you, if, you, if you lost your instruction sheet, you can click on that, download that. Um, we have a, a another section for documentation that you can search for um, through that. If you have an older item that's no longer in the line, um, you find that stuff there. We have a dealer locator on there where you can just put your zip code in. Wow. Um, find you know that. We have links to um, all the social media connections that you can click on and sign up for. And, and most importantly, click on our newsletter, email newsletter. We send out a weekly email newsletter that keeps you up to date on all product announcements and you know new arrivals as they come in. So that's awesome. Absolutely fantastic. I there's no way to follow that up other than oh. um, you just made news with that locomotive, the Dreyfus Hudson. Thanks. You know, we got a lot of positive response from it when we announced it and when we showed the it's amazing how it comes to life once the actual decoration gets put on the, the locomotive. Um, so are you, are you coming to Train Fest this year? I'm not sure yet. Undetermined. Okay. I'm sure some of the guys are. Um, okay. I'm just not sure how my schedule is going to work out yet. Gotcha. Yeah, it's a little bit different time frame than it has been in the past. But uh, things are doing. Things are percolating. The hobby is actually doing well. This is the best hobby in the world. And yes, it is. That's going to say that on top of our ad for December. The best hobby in the world. There you go. So rock and roll. So thank you, Larry. Thanks again. That's awesome. And that is this segment. See you next for time. October's what's neat. All of the products seen on this episode of What's Neat are available from Lombard Hobbies in Lombard, Illinois, or order online at LombardHobby.com. And by Broadway Limited Imports, the cutting-edge leader in model trains. Check out their website at Broadway-Limited.com. Bachman Trains, now that's the way to run a railroad. Check out their website at BachmanTrains.com. KR Models. We dare to build. Check out their website at krmodels.net.